are very, very honored to have amongst us Sadhguru today <laughs> for a question answer session. And a very warm welcome to you, to Safaya College, sir. Um, <coughs> if you would like to address the audience. Yes, uh, can, can I say a few words before the questions? <laughs> Namaskaram and good morning to everyone. This youth and truth, how it came about and why, is uh, in the last thirty-seven years, wherever I go, this has been a constant refrain that thousands of people keep telling me the same thing. Sadhguru, when I was twenty, where were you? You came when I'm sixty and what is the use now? You should have come when I'm… when I was twenty, I would have lived a completely different life. This has been a constant refrain by thousands of people. So I thought I will step out and uh, meet all those people who are below twenty-five years of age in this country and also in the rest of the world, so that they don't complain later on. What we call as life, is just a, a certain combination of time and energy. Certain amount of life energy, certain amount of time. Most people doesn't… do not pay attention to this. In Tamil language, are there Tamil people? Only two, huh? Okay. Oh. <laughs> In Tamil language, for death, the word for death is kalamaitanga. That means their time got over, it's a perfect description, just time gets over. As we sit here, our time is running out, isn't it? Hello? Yes. Is it not running out? It is tick ticking away. It doesn't matter how young, how old, what you're doing, what you're not doing, whether you're awake or you're asleep, for all of us, time is running out all the time. You can't roll it back, you can't stop it, it's just going away. So the only other ingredient that we have which we could manage and make something else out of is the energy, the life energy. Most youth do not understand this when they're young, that the segment of life that we call as youth is the time of your life when your energies are at your peak. Whole lot of people think that's how it's going to be all life, it's not going to be like that. You just have to pay attention to older people, how much trouble they're having with their energies <laughs> to keep it up. So this is just one segment of life when your energies are at their best. If only you had little more clarity about life and little more balance about yourself, you could play these energies differently because this level of peak energy will not happen again. This is just this segment of life which is referred to as youth, that energies are as exuberant as they are right now. So bringing clarity and balance means, essentially, if you have more clarity and balance, the time is running away for all of us. But if we manage our energies well, what somebody does in hundred years, another person does in ten years. That means if you live to be hundred, other people think you lived for a thousand years because of the impact of your life. And above all, every human being has a certain genius about themselves. I feel… tell me if my percentage is wrong. I feel in my perception, I feel not even one percent of humanity manages to unfold their genius, they'll never find the necessary ambience around them or within them so that they can unfold their genius. Their own thoughts, their own emotions, their own nonsense just holds them down. Only one percent or less is unfolding their genius. A society or a nation or even the entire world, as a generation of people, we either rise or we live a mediocre life depending upon how many human beings unfolded their genius, how many geniuses blossomed in a given society will determine how far that society, that nation will go. 
So, we thought by bringing little more clarity and balance to the youth, in this generation we would like to increase the percentage from less than one percent, if you can make it ten percent, phenomenal things will happen. If ten percent of the population manage to unfold their genius in the world, what will happen will be too incredible to describe. Right now a minuscule is doing this, rest of the humanity is largely a drag. For everything they will say, not possible, not possible, not possible. You have to drag them every day. Shall we change this? Hello? This is your life, this is your time on the planet. Yes? As a generation of people, this is our time on the planet. I want to make sure our time on the planet is the best time ever till now. Are you with me? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I want to see some more life with the yes. Okay, please. With your permission, Sadhguru, we should… Uh, we'll begin with our mm -hmm. question-answer session. My first question is, uh, how do we become more inclusive of diversity in the society? For instance, uh, the northeast of India, if you see, it's completely ignored, it's a fragment, uh, like it's been uh, pushed out of this country. I mean, a lot of people, they don't even know uh, what the seven states of Northeast are or how the people are or what their identity is. So how can we as the youth or all of us change this? How do we become more inclusive? Because if you see ignorance eventually leads to intolerance and communal problems and violence. So how do we become more inclusive of diversity today? Can I tell you a joke? Are you okay? <laughs> Can I? Some of you are very… because some of you are looking so serious, am I seeking permission? <laughs> Joshua Goldberg was a Vietnam veteran in America, in New York City. One day, he ordered for pizza and a Chinese boy came to deliver the pizza. He took the pizza, paid him the money and punched him in the face. So the boy fell down backwards, then he got up with a bloody nose and he said, why did you do that? He said, that's for Vietnam. <laughs> he said, I am not Vietnamese, I am Chinese. So Joshua Goldberg said, Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese, they're all same to me. So the boy gathered himself and went. Later on, after having eaten his pizza, he was taking his bull mastiff for a walk. There's a law in New York City, if your dog poops, you have to pick it up. So his dog pooped on the street, he bent down to pick it up, pick it up. The Chinese boy came from behind and kicked him in his backside. So he went down, face down on the dog poop. Then he got up and asked, you idiot, why did you do this to me? The boy said, that's for Titanic. <laughs> said, you idiot, what do I have to do with Titanic? Goldberg, Spielberg, Iceberg, they're all same to me <laughs> So, uh, every difference that we have, you and me look different, we are not able to enjoy the difference. We make every difference into a discriminatory process. Unfortunately, this has become the way of the world. Race, religion, nationality, ethnicity, you name it. If there's nothing else, we'll find something which doesn't exist. Goldsmith, blacksmith, all kinds of distinctions, <laughs> endless. What is the solution? See, when we sit here, this is my body, that's your body. No way to mix this, these two, two things up. That is yours, this is mine. That's one kind, this is another kind. This is my mind, that's your mind. No way to mix it up. This is one kind, that's another kind. 
If you're identified only with your body, you will naturally always look at me as something different. If you're identified with your thought process, you'll always see me as something very different. But there is no such thing as my life and your life. This life is same. This body can never be the same. This mind will never be the same. But this is a living cosmos. I captured this much life, you captured that much life, that's all. It's like, uh, did you girls blow soap bubbles when you were younger or you still do? You still blowing bubbles? <laughs> now, uh, if you blew your bubble, your bubble came this big, my bubble came this big. Oh, big bubble, small bubble, but poop it went. Now we are not saying this is my air, this is your air, isn't it? Yes or no? Fundamental life process, the identity with fundamental life process has not happened. We've gotten identified with the surface. The moment you identified with your body, you are a female, I'm a male. Gender is acting like two separate species in the world right now. Yes? Gender, badly people need each other. In spite of that, they're acting like they're separate species. Every small thing that is said, <laughs> boom, it blows up. <laughs> Because we are too much identified either with our body or with our thought process, our beliefs, ideologies. What we need is a deeper identity. Can I take a couple of minutes? In yoga, we look at human mind as sixteen parts. We can make this into four categories. These four dimensions of mind are referred to as buddhi, ahankara, Manas and chitta. Buddhi means the intellect. Your intellect, do you want it sharp or dull? You must choose right now, I'm going to bless you. Sharp. So it's a cutting instrument, it's like a knife. Knife should be used for certain things only. If you use knife to do everything, then uh, none of you girls are like this, I'm just looking for one of you. Some… you know, if you suppose use a knife to stitch a cloth, it'll be in tatters. Sometimes I'm wondering these days your denims, maybe you're using a knife to stitch <laughs> And not you, not you, you're good <laughs> So you cannot use a knife for everything, only for dissection you can use a knife. You cannot use a knife for everything. Right now, our education systems have become such, they're purely intellectual. The other dimensions of human intelligence are not even explored. Everything is intellectual. So all we are doing is dissect things, dissect things, dissect things. With this we will know certain things. Suppose I really want to know you, shall I dissect you? If I dissect you, I will know the condition of your heart, liver, kidney, spleen, everything. But you will be gone. Maybe by embracing you, I may know you, but by dissecting you, I will not know you, isn't it? This is what we are doing with intellect, we are constantly trying to dissect everything because our entire education system is focused just on the intellect. The next dimension is called ahankara. People generally think ahankara means ego, no, ahankara means identity. Depending upon what you are identified with, accordingly your intellect will function that way. Today tell yourself, I'm a woman, I'm a woman, I'm a woman. You will see your intellect functions just for that, that, that. You tell yourself, I'm Indian, Indian, Indian. It will work just for that. Yes or no? You just see the moment you're identified with something, what you're identified with always looks right, something else always looks wrong, isn't it? So this is the nature of the intellect. What is the identity? Accordingly it functions. So in this culture, we had a system, before we start education for a child, first thing is, he must say, Aham Brahmasmi. This means, my identity is with the universe. You must establish a larger identity before you empower somebody with education, because education is empowerment. If you empower somebody with narrow identity, they will do something else. See, right now, what is science and technology doing? The cutting-edge science is all going to military use, isn't it? The most horrible things that have been done on the planet, 
have been empowered by science and technology, unfortunately. The greatest gifts that we have, have turned against us simply because of our small identity. I am India or I am Pakistan, I am this or that, endlessly it is going on. It is just a narrow identity which makes a human being absolutely dangerous. You can call it crime, you can call it evil, you can call it genocide. Essentially, it's limited identity, isn't it? So one fundamental thing that we need to do in our education systems is that everybody has a limitless identity. Identify at least with the world, if not with the universe. If you cannot conceptualize a universe, at least your identity is global. Now the next dimension of the mind is called as manas. If you want to continue that knife ideology or uh, analogy, knife is there, ahankara is the hand that holds it. It is the hand that holds the knife which determines whether this is going… this knife is going to save a life or take a life, isn't it so? It is not the knife which is dangerous, every day knife is saving more lives than taking lives, isn't it so? Knives are saving lives, but in the wrong hand it will take a life. So the hand has to be tempered, the hand has to be studied. Nothing wrong with the knife, the sharper it is, the better it is. Knife should be sharper, no? Knife should be as sharp as possible, it is the hand that holds it which makes the difference. Now this hand is connected to what is called as manas, which is a silo of memory. See right now, you call this my body, but this is just a silo of memory. There is evolutionary memory, there is genetic memory, there is karmic memory, there's articulate and inarticulate levels of memory, conscious and unconscious levels of memory. Like this, there are many dimensions of memory. Do you remember? how your great-grandmother ten generations ago looked like? No, but her nose is sitting on your face right now. Chatakshi, I got the name right for you, yes. see? <laughs> her nose is sitting on your face or no? Definitely. Your skin remembers the skin tone of your forefathers a million years ago, yes or no? So this is memory, what you call as my body, is a trillion times more memory than what you ever can carry in your mind. So this memory is important and how it transmits itself into the intellect depends on the identity. How you identified, accordingly this memory will play. If you identified with a limited mem identity, then this memory will become against everybody else. If your identity is a larger identity, then this memory functions for everybody's well-being. So the fundamental thing is, your identification has to evolve. How does your identity evolve? The fourth dimension of intelligence is referred to as chitta. Chitta means an intelligence without, without an iota of memory. When we say memory, memory is a certain boundary. See, I remember these three are my friends, they're in my boundary. These people I don't remember. They're out of my boundary, isn't it so? Hello? Who is my friend, who is not my friend, who, who I love, who I hate, is just a question of memory, isn't it? Who is my brother, who is my sister, who is my father, who is my mother, is it just a question of memory? Memory in your mind and your genetic memory, isn't it so? It's all this memory functioning. So there is an intelligence which is beyond memory, which doesn't have an iota of memory. Where there is no memory, there is no boundary, it's a boundless intelligence. This is a living cosmos, which is intelligent. It is a living intelligence of its own. Now, this dimension of intelligence also exists within us. The moment you touch this dimension of intelligence, all your limited identities will collapse. And in the yogic culture, in a very mischievous way, it is said, you must understand this in the right context, because you're looking serious, it scares me, huh? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Do something to show me you're not so serious people. <laughs> because, see, suppose somebody comes and tells you, my grandmother is serious, how do you understand? She's on the way out. That's what it means if you're serious <laughs> So in the yogic culture it is said, if you touch your chitta, 
if you touch an intelligence beyond memory, they say, God will become your slave. Whatever you wish, it just happens for you because you are not stuck in the framework of memory anymore, your intelligence. So, if we want an unprejudiced world genuinely, genuinely unprejudiced world, because today people who call themselves, people who seem to be fighting all the time for somebody, they are highly prejudiced too, in a different way, in a reverse way. This is not going to help. Pushing one just injustice against another injustice is not an answer. It is not an answer for the well-being of this world. It is important that your experience of life is beyond the limitations of the boundaries of your memory, which means your body, your mind, your intellect, beyond that you have an experience. If your experience of life transcends the limitations of your physical nature, then we use this most corrupt word, corrupted word rather, a highly corrupted word called spirituality. This is what spirituality means. Spirituality doesn't mean looking up, looking down, going to heaven, no. Spiritual process means your experience of life has crossed the limitations of your physical nature. It's only because of physical body, there is a clear-cut boundary between you and me, isn't it? Yes or no? Suppose you didn't have a body and I didn't have a body, we would be all over the place, isn't it? Yes or no? So, because of our identifications with physical forms, I am different, you are different. Now this difference slowly matures into discrimination. Sorry, did it answer your question? <laughs> uh, Sadhguru, how do you suggest that we appropriately question authority without being disrespectful towards them? Because from our very childhood, we've been uh, taught to obey our elders because they know better and uh, they are right. But they're only humans and it's possible that they are wrong or they make an error in judgment. So, um, do you think… So, I'm not talking just in context of parents, it could be political leaders, scientists, experts… Me also, me also. <laughs> uh, spiritual leaders as well. Uh, how do we question them? to look beyond that traditional paradigm. Just the way you're doing it right now. <laughs> Without being disrespectful, I do, I understand, but it is possible that do, they take it as… Um, as challenging their authority. So, uh, <clears throat> see respect, you use the word respect. Respect is not something that you ever demand in your life. Please don't ever do such a vulgarity that you demand respect. You can only earn it, you cannot demand it. The moment you demand it, it becomes vulgar, yes or no? So you stand one step higher than somebody and you demand respect. Or the only stupid thing that you did is you came here a few years earlier than someone else and you demand that I'm senior. It must be happening in the college also, huh? One year senior I am, hey, you better respect me. Huh? Just one year ahead I joined the college and now I'm senior, okay? So, this is an unfortunate reality that's well established in the world that in the name of religion, in the name of authority, in the name of parenthood, in many different ways, we have been trying to establish authority is the truth. No. Authority is not the truth, truth is the only authority. This is why, youth and truth. <laughs> truth is the only authority, nothing else is the authority. So if I ask a question, somebody freaks. See, if you ask a question, somebody freaks because they don't know the answer. Suppose you go sit in an examination and look at the question paper, you don't know a damn thing, don't you freak? Just like that they're freaking, why don't you understand? <laughs> Hello <laughs> so you… they gave you a question paper, you have no clue, do you freak or no? So they are also freaking. So you must understand and be a little compassionate. When you ask a question, somebody freaks means obviously they don't have an answer. 
So you must be compassionate, considerate because they're your seniors. <laughs> they came ahead of here, ahead of you, but they are no better than you, so they're freaking a bit. Please make way for them, I like right? What to do? They've grown a little bigger than you. <laughs> but at the same time, there is no need for anybody to succumb to that. It's all right, there is no need to confront people. A question, first of all. See, a question is a tool. A question is a tool to dig a little deeper, isn't it? Hello? But somebody is asking a question to prove a point, that's not good. So don't ask a question to your parents or to somebody else just to prove your point. No, ask a question because it's a genuine question. So people were asking me, Sadhguru, what kind of questions can we ask, what can we not ask? I said, even the dumbest question you have, if it means something to you, it means something to me. If it doesn't mean anything to you, don't ask such stupid things because it doesn't mean a damn thing to me either. But if it means something to you, maybe it's a stupid question, somebody thinks it's a stupid question, but it means something to your life, it means a lot to me. So, please make sure your questions are genuine, whether you ask a parent or a political leader or a spiritual leader, it doesn't matter who the hell you ask a question. When you ask a question, you must understand the purpose of asking a question is to expand yourself from what you know to enter a territory where you do not know something. That's the idea of asking a question. But you ask a question to prove them stupid, then maybe they're getting mad. <laughs> so you are entering their territory now. But you have to make sure in your life, because your life is not just about your life. How you conduct your life will determine the nature of this world, isn't it so? When you have such a responsibility, you have to ensure that truth is the only authority. Authority is not the truth. It doesn't matter whether it's parents or teachers or spiritual teachers, political leaders or God himself came down and he said something stupid. You must be able to question him. That is the nature of this culture. See, even when those entities which we considered divine came, in India all we did is ask questions, Endless questions, when Shiva came, his wife Parvati freaks him with a million questions. When Krishna came, Arjuna asked thousand questions, questions and questions and questions, I must tell you this. We were trekking in uh, Tibet, a group of people, uh, almost from forty-two different countries. So an Indian man who settled in United States uh, was… Uh, wanted to ask a question. I said, you can ask questions, immediately he raised his hand and he stood up. He asked a question which lasted over eight minutes and it was going on. I said, see, this is too long a question. <laughs> then I told others because they were all looking like this, because they're from different nations, they can't understand this question. I said, see, this is a very Indian question. <laughs> question inside a question, inside a question, inside a question, inside a question. In Indians are experts in this because they have fifteen thousand years of culture, they've crafted questions like this. We doesn't matter, Shiva comes, Krishna comes, they want to bowl a googly to him <laughs> That's the whole intent. So I said, this is, this is an Indian question and I tried to explain to them, what is an Indian mind and why it asks such questions? <laughs> so much of culture. Then one Chinese lady, she says, Sadhguru, I was working at the United Nations, even there only Indians ask questions <laughs> We never ask questions, only the Indians were asking questions all the time. I said, that is India <laughs> Please. Uh, Sadhguru, my next question for you is, uh, why can't one husband be with multiple women and one woman or a wife can be with multiple husbands in today's society among consenting adults. And uh, what impact do these uh, people have when they're involved in such relationships? Well, there are many aspects. So historically, you know there has been a Draupadi who had five husbands, all right? There is, this has been a matriarchal society, 
where in many parts of the country, even today in some parts of the country, it's still practiced that uh, five brothers are married to one woman. These things were done at a certain time when the social situations were such. Or men were married to many more… I mean more than one woman. This was mainly because men died more often than women. Today, both men and women are outside, both may get killed, that's different. <laughs> but at that time, largely women stayed home because she was continuously pregnant. From the age of fourteen to forty-five, fifty, she's almost all the time either ha she's pregnant or she has a young child. This is how life used to be. So because of that, she stayed home and she took care of the property and the agriculture and stuff. Man went out to do business or for war or something else, he went out. So men always died more often. So generally, in most societies in the past, the number of men was much less than the number of women. Always, this has been the state all across the world. So naturally when so many women were there, they needed care and they needed support in the society and those days a woman could not exist by herself. She, unless she is protected by a male uh, a partner, it would be very difficult for her to exist by herself because she would be exploited in so many different ways. So always they attach themselves. So naturally a man ended up having two, three women because the num… the population ratio was like that. But now largely it's leveled out. If some individual does it, it's not an issue, but if that becomes a social norm, then how do you decide somebody has whatever, multiple wives, and how do you decide somebody has no wife? This will become a social, you know, collision it'll become. It'll become lot of problems in the society because we may act civilized. I'm… I'm very particular, I'm very clear about saying we act civilized, but we, when we are denied basic things that we need, all our civilization evaporates and we will behave… behave like animals. Yes or no? So, when fundamentals are denied, people will go flashing. So that's not going to work in today's world. And above all, the women's condition will become very bad. Those days there was no dirt, if you had land, it was okay. You had five wives, it doesn't matter. You had twenty-five acres, it was good enough, everybody ate well and that's about it. But today our requirements are not just about eating, it's about many things. So that kind of thing will lead to lot of complicated situations in the society. It's better to stick one-on-one -on -one and uh, anyway, forever people have been doing their own things beyond the legal relationships, things have been happening in the societies. That involves a certain risk, somebody who is willing to take that risk, that's for them. But others will live within the legal format, it's a balanced society. If you are asking this question in a more existential way, well, <clears throat> see, this… this is a certain framework of not just of bone and muscle and flesh, there is a certain energy framework. Only because of that it takes in a certain form. See, if you eat mangoes every day and let's say a cow eats mangoes every day, at some point will you or the cow get confused whether you are a cow or a human being or will the cow get confused? Such a thing never happens because there is a clear-cut inner framework to which flesh and blood is added. But there is a framework, an evolutionary memory framework is there, it never gets broken, isn't it? So in this framework, how strong you keep this framework, how, integ how much integrity is there to this energy framework will determine many things about your life, many aspects of your life. Especially if you want to ra raise this life to another level of function, it's very important you maintain this integrity. This is why irrespective of which religion, which spiritual process, if people want to raise them till to a certain point, first thing they will talk about is becoming monks or brahmacharis or sannyasis because the idea is to create such a level of integrity that this is a whole life by itself. 
that it doesn't lean on anything else for support, either for physical well-being or emotional well-being or psychological companionship, it doesn't lean on anything, it stands by itself because you want to take it somewhere else. If you want normal function, these things are not necessary. Now you want to become a rocket which breaks through a certain dimension of space, now you need to be in a different level of force and integrity, otherwise it'll crack up. So you don't want to open your body to anything and especially opening to multiple partners has its own negativity in that context. How much pain and you look at uh, Draupadi's life, how much volatility, how much pain, how much suffering she went through in her life and how much pain and suffering she caused because of her anger and jealousy and whatever else. So these things happen for a variety of reasons, you can't blame everything on that one aspect, but that aspect also has a, a say in these aspects because you are opening up your uh, memory body, your energy, energetic body which is essentially ruled by memory to variety of memories. This will cause a whole lot of turmoil within the system which could affect that life and many other lives. So Draupati's life is in a way a sample for that. It's not an absolute, this is not an absolute but this has an influence. Thank you Sadhguru. Um, we see uh, that people who want to have children but are unable to conceive one themselves invest a lot of time, energy and money into fertility treatments when there are so many kids around the world uh, who are waiting to be adopted. Uh, I understand that adoption is not the cure for uh, infertility. It is though the cure for childlessness. So if the purpose is to uh, rear a child, have a child, love a child, provide a home, why not just adopt a child who's already waiting for a home and to be loved? See, uh, already many doctors and organizations are uh, trolling me and putting me on fire because I said first thing in India is you must close down this… all these damn fertility clinics. When the country is exploding with population, god damn it, you have fertility, fertility clinics, you need an infertility bomb. So because I said this, I'm in lot of trouble, now you try drawing me into more trouble <laughs> Yes, uh, this problem again goes back to the first question. This is because you're so horribly identified with your own biology. It has to come out of your body, otherwise it's not yours. It is such a gross way of existence. Unless it comes out of my body, it doesn't belong to me. Well, you're married to a man or a woman, they didn't come out of your body. No, but our bodies are meeting, that's why. See, the identity has become so grossly biological. Unless in some way it's biological interaction, it is not really a relationship. In fact, today everybody, all of you have picked up these words from America. It just used to surprise me, but now that is the usage. If somebody says, I have a relationship, you are supposed to understand that they have a sexual relationship. Well, I have a relationship with you sitting here. This need not be body-based, yes or no? We are looking at each other, do we have a relationship or no? But why only body-based relationships are relationships? Isn't this a relationship? Hello? Your relationship with biology, leave it. Your parents, your brothers, your sisters, leave that. Your friend, is this not a relationship? Huh? Your milkman who comes and pours milk and uh, makes your life going today, is this not a relationship? Isn't your taxi driver a relationship, I'm asking? No, no, you're not supposed to say that. If you say relationship, people will assume you're sleeping with them. Yes, unfortunate, isn't it? Relationships are of many kinds. Human beings can form varieties of relationships. But right now, unfortunately, we think only if bodies come together or only if something comes out of this body, it's a relationship worthwhile. Other things are not relationships. No, we have to change this language because this is causing a lot of, you know, pain to people because body is the front end. See, body is the front end for every other creature on this planet. 
The only reason this creature is dominating this planet is not because we have the best body. You're not comparable to an elephant or a tiger or anything for that matter, you're not even as good as a buffalo. <laughs> yes, in terms of strength and physical prowess, you're nowhere comparable. This is dominant because of its intelligence, this is dominant because of its consciousness. But right now, we are creating a world where your biology is the front end of your life, this has to change. Because the biology is the front end of your life, you think your child means it has to come through you. Not that natural child… childbearing process is a bad thing. It is just that if you were a tiger, if you were a tigress, I would say, please go to the fertility clinic soon because, uh, you know, it's becoming extinct, huh? <laughs> Their numbers are dwindling and they may disappear, but human beings, huh? <laughs> Just too many. <laughs> we are nice, but we are too many, aren't we? Hello? We are just too many. In the beginning of twentieth century, we were just 1.6 billion people. Today we are 7.6 billion people in hundred years or four times. But in India, of course, we do better than others. <laughs> 1947, we were 33 crores, today we are 127 crores, 70 years. Well, this is not just because of excessive reproduction, because our life expectancy has improved. In 47, our life expectancy was only 28 years of age. Today it's reached somewhere around sixty-six, which is a phenomenal achievement for the nation, it's great. But what I'm asking is, if you postpone death, should you also not postpone birth? Hello? This is not a philosophy, this is not ideology, this is simple arithmetic. Yes? This is simple arithmetic. If this many people were exiting, you are in a college right now, this year, how many people exit, that many people they will admit, isn't it? Doesn't that work for the globe also, for the planet also? This many people exited, so this many people should come in. If you say this, you think, are you doing animal husbandry with us? <laughs> are you doing Hitler's business? This is what… Oh, this is Nazi talk. Well, you multiply unconsciously, nature will do it in a very cruel way one day. Yes? If we don't consciously take steps as human beings, nature will do it one day in a very cruel manner. And that cruelty won't come like bang like that, it happens slowly. Crushing happens slowly. Already it's happening. Farmers are committing suicide, students are committing suicide, all kinds of people are doing all kinds of things. Why? Somewhere life is becoming hard, isn't it? Though as a generation, we have highest levels of comfort and convenience. Life is becoming hard simply because of the concentration of population. We are doing all kinds of ecological nonsense. But right now, United Nations is making a prediction by 2050, we will be 9.6 billion people. Madam, you have to raise your floor, <laughs> fifty floors. No, no, this won't be enough. <laughs> fifty floors you must raise because they will be full like ants everywhere. 9.6 billion people, nobody can live well on this planet. Instead of making a prediction like this, we will be 9.6, why can't we plan? By 2050, we will be 3.5 billion people. Oh, what should we do, what should we do? If you don't do anything, population will go down. <laughs> My next question to you, Sadhguru, is um, when something bad happens to somebody and uh, we know that it's always on their conscious, like conscience, they're thinking about it a lot of times, but eventually there comes a point where they are ready to let it go. But somewhere there's a guilt that if they let this thing go, like something that that's been, that's troubled them for so many years. There's this guilt where they're af they don't want to let, let the past go because they feel guilty of letting it go. So why does that happen and how do we let go of that guilt? Like even if we take, for instance, sexual abuse, 
if a girl is sexually abused and eventually if she reaches a point where she is ready to overcome it but she feels guilty to let it go because it has troubled her for a very very long time and not just her the ones around her as well so is it right to let it go at that point or like how do how does one deal with a situation like this see i think the struggle is coming from a misunderstanding that something either unpleasant or terrible that one may encounter in one's life. It can just happen to anybody in so many different ways. If it happens, people think they must forget it. No, you should never forget it. If something terrible happens to you, you should never ever forget it because if you forget it, you may walk into it again. But we must know the distinction between what is memory and what is living. You are living. Memory is a dead memory, you're supposed to use it as wisdom to see such things don't happen to you in your life. But… but it's a fact that for most people, what happened ten years ago, they still suffer. Hmm? What may happen day after tomorrow, they already suffer. Yes or no? <laughs> what happened ten years ago or even ten days ago does not exist right now. Does it? Does it? No. What may happen day after tomorrow does not exist right now, does it? No. So you are suffering essentially something that does not exist. How many of you are psychology students, huh? Is there a, a medical term for those people who are suffering something that does not exist? No, no, don't tell them please, they'll suffer that <laughs> If you are suffering something that does not exist, on some level it means insanity, isn't it? This may sound very cruel to you right now when I say this, because, oh, I got my pains. See, you are… you are carrying your pains like badge, don't do that. When something bad happens to us, when something hurts us, we can either become wise or wounded, this is a choice we have. Either we can become wise with it or we can become wounded with it. As we already went through this, life is just a certain amount of time. It's ticking away. As you sit here now, you are one hour closer to the grave since you came here. Yes or no? Yes, it is. It's going away for all of us. So in this, where is the time to carry every experience like a wound? No. This must become your wisdom. If terrible things happen to you, you must become wiser than others, sooner than others, isn't it? But unfortunately, most people choose to become wounded simply because, again, in our systems of education, we have done nothing about the nature of human mind. We are busy studying frogs and cockroaches and trees and chemistry and physics and planets and everything. No attention to the nature of this one. So we don't know how to use our faculties. The greatest faculties that you have right now as a human being is, you have a vivid sense of memory. Everything that happened, you can remember as if it's alive right now. Yes? There is a repository here, there's an archive in your mind which can replay the whole video if you want. But this has become a problem. You started suffering the old movies. And there is a fantastic sense of imagination, so you already suffer a tomorrow which is yet to come. This is basically because we have not taught our children and the people in the world how to employ our faculties, how to use our memory, how to use our imagination, how to experience life right now, how to sharpen the experience now. Your whole life is happening between these three dimensions – memory, present experience and imagination. This is your life, isn't it? These are three dimensions. We call them trikala, three dimensions of time. All your experience of life is happening here, but if you lose distinction between what is past, what is present, what is future, then everything hurts. For not everybody, terrible things have happened. Unfortunately, for a few people, it, they have happened. But the rest of the people are simply suffering something, isn't it? 
because it's fashionable to suffer. Just <laughs> people think if they're suffering, they are very intellectual, they are very profound. No, it's just stupid because you're suffering something that doesn't exist. You're not suffering what's happening right now. You're suffering what happened yesterday and you're suffering something that may happen tomorrow already. So this madness has been encouraged simply because we never train people how to use their faculties. Do you agree with me that this human machine that you carry and I carry, this is the most sophisticated machine on the planet? Hello? Yes. Have you read the user's manual? User's manual, have you read? No. When are you going to read it? On the last day. <laughs> if you get a phone, if you buy a phone, should you read the user's manual in the first three days or after three years when you're discarding the phone? Earliest, isn't it? Within the first day you must read, then only you can use this phone well. The same goes for this. If you do not understand the nature of what this is, how will you put this to use? It is consuming you, your own intelligence is consuming you. You can call it stress, anxiety, pain, suffering, whatever. Essentially, your intelligence is turned against you, that's all the reality is. If your intelligence was working for you, taking instructions from you, you would keep yourself blissed out, wouldn't you? Hello? Your intelligence is turned against you. Why has your intelligence turned against you? That's what you need to look at, not about carrying these stupid things that have happened which should not have happened as badges in our life. This may get a lot of women against me. <laughs> if I was against you, I wouldn't be here. Yes? <laughs> My next question to you, Sadhguru. How does one decide whether one should or should not have premarital sex? And does it prepare us for a better marital life? See, different people are made differently, this happened. There was a little turtle, baby turtle. With great difficulty, it climbed up a tree, went and sat on the edge of a branch and jumped, fell flat on the ground. Again, it took another twenty-four hours for it to slowly climb, get to that branch, again jump, again fell flat. Like this, it, day after day it was doing. Then there were two birds in the opposite tree, they were sitting there and among themselves they shook their head and said, I think it's time we tell him he's adopted <laughs> For everybody, we're trying to draw the same prescription. This is not going to work because I've seen, you know, every day I'm meeting thousands of people, they're poor, they are problems on me, all kinds of stuff. What I see is all these people who talked about great amount of freedom, when it comes to their personal lives, after thirty, forty years of marriage, not two, three years, after thirty years of marriage, still what the wife did or the husband did thirty-five years ago, still point of conflict. Have you seen or no? You have also seen. So when you know this is the state of human mind, you must know what to do and what not to do. It is not… it is not a question of morality. It's a question of what kind of life do you want to craft for yourself. It's about that. Is it a morality? Is it that nobody should get into anything or everybody should get into something? There's no such thing. What kind of life are you wanting to craft for yourself? A kind of life where your relationships mean really binding yourself in such a way that truly you can depend on yourself or it's like visiting restaurants every day you want to taste something new and see, but you could get very unhealthy with that. There are some people who stick to their home food, though it tastes about the same every day. But those people are generally healthy, isn't it? <laughs> this is not… I'm not trying to teach you a moral class. I'm not a moral class person, 
But these kind of things are happening in the society, people are trying to draw prescriptions. Everybody must do this, otherwise you're no good, or everybody should not do it, otherwise you're no good. No, that's not the way. There was a time in this culture and even every culture, by the time a girl is fifteen or sixteen, she was married. By the time a boy is seventeen or eighteen, he was married. Now because of our education systems and professional requirements and society has changed, everything has changed. Because of that, average marriage age for girls is around twenty-four in this country right now and for boys it's crossing twenty-eight, thirty. The peak of hormonal impact on human life is somewhere between fifteen to thirty. After that it's not the same thing. So, this is at least something we must debate. But we should not be hasty to draw a conclusion, this is the way, that is the way. We must give enough awareness to people that they don't get into something compulsively which they regret later. If consciously, if people see that this is the way I want to craft my life, that's up to the individual. But there is no common prescription, it should… there should never be a common prescription. Because individual requirements are very different. We have a few questions that uh, were posted on social media <laughs> and have become very popular, like they were po popularly questions asked. Questions have become popular? I mean, a lot of people okay. had asked those questions, okay. that's what I meant. So, we have a few uh, here today that we would wish… Uh, that we wish to ask you. So, the first question, uh, I'll take the first question. Uh, this question is from Subhashish Mukherjee and he says, I want to know the truth of black magic. My non-Bengali friends believe black magic has come into existence from West Bengal. How much <laughs> truth is there in this? It's a very Bengali question. Eh? <laughs> the truth <laughs> they're not asking how much truth in the black magic, they're asking whether it came from West Bengal or not. Well, uh, Kerala people believe it came from Kerala. It's little fishy, both the populations <laughs> Lot of fish in them, you know <laughs> So, uh, at one time in this country, as you have uh, a family doctor, they used to have a witch doctor. Almost every family had somebody to consult on these kind of aspects because these arts were so widespread. Did it originate in Bengal? Did it originate in Kerala? No, I think it survived more in Kerala and Bengal today. In other places it's gotten a little wiped out. Essentially what you're talking about is occult. Occult is a certain technology that you can use your energies uh, to create certain impact. But unfortunately, it's gotten very negative press because market was for the negative. So people used it more negatively than positively. It could also be used positively. It's like any other technology, you can either use it positively or negatively. Unfortunately, the negative usage became overwhelmingly larger than the positive usage. So people think occult means it's a negative. No, the usage has become unfortunately negative. It could also be used in a positive manner. When I say it could also be used in a positive manner, you can transform life with it. You could… Uh, people make people help people out of their health situations, out of their psychological situations, various things could be done. Instead of that, because the market is mainly for the negative, somebody pays you to cause detriment to some other life at the benefit of somebody else's… to somebody else's benefit. To your detriment, somebody else's benefit it is being done. Because of that, it's gotten a negative image. Occult is like this. See, right now all of you have a phone. Suppose you had a phone hundred years ago, cell phone hundred years ago, you could claim you have occult powers because you could just take this and speak to somebody in America, everybody woo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, they will shiver, okay? <laughs> yes or no? 
So occult is just technology. You could communicate, you could use your energies to communicate with somebody. But as modern technology becomes more and more subtle, the need for occult is receding, receding quite a bit because so many things that we used to do in occult, today can be delivered. You can send a WhatsApp message, you don't have to sit there focusing to send a message to somebody anymore. It took a lot more energy and time to do that. Now, message goes. So, messaging business has completely fallen out of occult. Otherwise, occult was mainly used to deliver messages to people in a different way. You have heard of telepathy and telecommunic… you know, not telecommunication, telekinetics and various other things where things were done from a distance. But today all those things are being done by regular technology, so occult or the requirement for occult is withdrawing. The need is just going away and probably most of it will go away. There are a few things that one could do, but above all, if… if we created a society that whatever is given to you, you will use it in a positive way, occult can be a tremendous possibility, as technology can be a tremendous possibility. As I mentioned earlier, most of the technology is used for developing arms and armaments and bombs and nuclear bombs and more and more destructive things. The same thing could have been used for something else. Absolutely, positive things could have been done, but that's not been done because the market is for the negative. Similarly, the same things have happened to Uncle, your uh, Mukherjee friend. Uh <laughs> well, I think, from what I hear, I think Kerala tops in the occult practices even today. Next comes West Bengal. Next probably some northeastern states have this, but they're very rudimentary occult. Kerala occult is quite sophisticated. You will see a lot of occult in North America, in the North American tribes, but very basic, mainly messaging as occult. But now they all have smartphones, so it's all going out. I think Kashmir at one time had a lot of occult. Bengal, Kerala, Northeast, well, some parts of Andhra Pradesh and Orissa, but now market is done. Next question, sir. What type of food we should eat so that our life reaches its full potential for a college or a school-going student? And it's by Spurti. Oh <coughs> Well, we must understand this. Food is not a religion. Food is not a culture. Food is just a fuel for this machine. Yes? There may be cultural aspects to the taste. There may be even religious tinge to the food over a period of time, but essentially food is fuel for this body. So with what kind of food will it function with minimum struggle within itself and maximum impact? So suppose you buy a petrol car and pump diesel into it, it may still roll around but not at its optimum. Similarly, various foods you can eat and still somehow it functions. But those communities which have eaten with care, you can clearly see a distinct difference in the way they function, the levels of intelligence and whatever. So in India, we prescribed food for different people in different way. If you're doing menial jobs, you eat one way because you need physical muscle. If you're doing other kinds of trading and other kinds of activities, you eat another way. If you're a fighting class, you eat differently. And now if you are into education, spiritual process and subtler aspects of life, then you eat differently. Now that you mentioned students, I believe you are in education. Yes? Okay. If you are in education, one of the greatest challenges is to stay focused on something. The goddamn textbook, the wonderful textbook <laughs> that is written, is written for an average intelligence. It's a common prescription. It's not written for the brilliant student. 
it is written in a way that it's a common prescription, everybody gets it. But that textbook, how much effort it is taking for a whole lot of people? How they have to read it ten times to get it? But you lie down in your bed and read a love story, you remember every word, huh? <laughs> yes or no? How come? So you don't lack memory, you don't lack focus, it is just that textbook and you chemistry is not uh, working <laughs> So what you need is a higher level of focus, a higher level of involvement. And another great enemy for a student is, because this textbook is such a tranquilizer, the moment you open it, <laughs> go to cinema till 2 a.m. you're up, open the textbook at nine o'clock, right there you smash into it. <laughs> so sleep is another big enemy. So what kind of food do you eat so there is no inertia in the body? In yogic way of seeing things, we are looking at tamas, rajas and sattva. Tamas means inertia, rajas means activity but no balance. Sattva means absolutely balanced kind of energy. When you're in education, you need a very balanced kind of energy because you have to focus on something which doesn't naturally interest you. It's not something that… with which your chemistry is gelling. If your chemistry is gelling, you are always focused on that one, isn't it? Here there's no chemistry but you have to focus on that. For this you need a balance and a steady mind. For this you need… need to eat in a certain way. I will make this very simple, but uh, if you want, I can send you a full-fledged video where all of you can see for maybe forty-five minutes to an hour, what is food and how it works in your system, how it relates to your physiology, why food behaves the way it behaves, an entire system of it. But to put it very simply, food goes through your body, through the alimentary canal. From your mouth to your anal outlet, there is a pipe. Through this it runs, going through various stages of digestive process. Many of you are biology people, right? So, it goes through the alimentary canal. Now it begins with the… the lip. Here if you look at this, all the herbivores and carnivores, if you look at the animal kingdom, there are herbivores and carnivores are two main segments of animals in the world. One eats vegetable matter, another eats meat. If you look at the alimentary canal, the way it is built, between herbivores and carnivores, there's a distinct difference. Everything in the human being suggests that you are naturally a herbivore, but for the sake of survival, we became carnivores. If you look at the moment, jaw moment, all the carnivorous animals have only cutting action. Herbivores have cutting and grinding action. There are molars, but carnivores don't have widespread molars, they have just incisors, canines, and everything looks like cutting teeth. So they do only this, all the herbivores do grinding. What do you have? Both. So you are supposed to chew your food. Why you are supposed to chew your food is they ha you have enzymes in your saliva, where if you take a little bit of raw rice and put it in your mouth just for a minute, you will see it turns sweet right here, because right here sh uh, carbohydrate is being converted into sugar right here. So if you eat properly, then we say about thirty to fifty percent of your digestion should happen in your mouth. So this part of the digestive system is expecting half digested food or partially digested food. But right now the way we're eating is mostly we're putting not only undigested food, but partially destroyed food. So the amount of food that you need to get the same amount of energy has increased. You are eating much more food than what you should eat to generate that much of energy. Because of that, there is inertia in the body because it has to process so much more food than what it should, there is inertia. Once there is inertia, your sleep quota increases. How many hours do you sleep on? Hello? Eight hours. You're going with a prescription, eh? <laughs> hmm? See, this is not that you must deny yourself sleep, that's not the point. But if you eat right and do a certain things with your body, you see very effortlessly 
within three to four weeks you can drop your sleep quota anywhere between two to three hours. One and a half to three hours very easily you can drop if you just eat consciously and just learn to sit properly, you know, just the posture, your geometry of the body and what goes into the system. If you just manage these two things, you will see sleep quota will just come down like that. Just to tell you, for over twenty-five years, I have largely managed with an average of two and a half hours of sleep. Now I'm getting lazy and I'm sleeping, averaging somewhere around four and a half hours now, but seven days of the week, okay? Three hundred sixty-five days, non-stop, on, 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 ev almost every day. My daughter didn't call me for a month, I asked, what the hell is the problem with you, why are you not calling? She said, every six hours you're in the new city, what the hell am I supposed to do? So I said, okay, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> in one day sometimes we're doing three cities, so it's a non-stop activity. And today many people around me have learned to do this. Over hundred, hundred and fifty people around me are doing this kind of activity, averaging four hours sleep and seven days of the week, they're on, 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 all the time. And uh, they are not irritated, they are not frustrated, they're joyful and they're wonderful. Why this is this? There are many aspects to this, but one important aspect is food, how you eat. Not only what you eat, how you eat is also very important because food is a live thing. One simple thing all you girls can do is just see various health issues and inertia issue, focus issue, just bring forty to fifty percent of the food in its raw form, that means it's alive. It must be a live cell, it can be a vegetable, it can be a fruit, it can be a nut, it can be sprouted gram. At least forty to fifty percent, the food that you eat must be alive. You eat dead food and you want to live, this is a little difficult thing to do <laughs> because you have to raise the dead now. <laughs> but if you eat live food, one thing you will see is the state of your mind, your focus and your sleep quotas and above all staying awake is not good enough, you have to stay alert, isn't it? How alert you are, how focused you are, only to that extent everything yields to you in this world, isn't it so? What is the level of focus will determine whether the world yields to you or not, isn't it? And one more aspect of life, one more aspect of food is, when you consume something, it must be of a simple uh, genetic code in the sense, it must be a very simple software. Vegetables, fruits, nuts, sprouts, they're very simple. More complicated means animal food becomes more and more complicated. Suppose you eat an animal which has some amount of emotion and a life of its own. Now the code in that… we were talking about this, your body is just an accumulation of memory, which means a certain software, isn't it? This is the most complex software. Human software is the most complex software on the planet of all the creatures. From an amoeba to this, this is the most complex… I'm not talking about her <laughs> She's looking… yes, yes. <laughs> This is the most… this is safe <laughs> This is the most complex software. So if you eat an animal, particularly a mammal, if you eat, it has a similar kind of complexity, maybe not as complex as this, similar level of complexity because it has thought and emotion of its own. Now for you to break that code and integrate it into your system, you are not fully successful. So it will leave traces of certain qualities within you. Otherwise, the best food would be eat human, human flesh because it's same. But you cannot break that. You cannot break that code and make it a part of yours because it's a different and complex code. If you eat a leaf, a vegetable, a fruit, a nut or a sprout, this is much simpler. If you must eat non-vegetarian food, you must eat that which is furthest away from you. So generally, fish and water life is furthest away from you. So if you must eat non-vegetarian food, the best thing to eat is uh, you have a… you are on the coast <laughs> Fish is the best thing to eat that way. Thank you, Sadhguru. Uh, um, we have a very enthusiastic audience and I'm sure they have a lot of questions to ask. So… They're about to fall asleep, that's what I'm saying. Yes.
हेलो नमस्कार सदगुरु माय नेम इज करिश्मा जोशी एंड आई वाज एन ईशा होम स्कूल स्टूडेंट या हाउ कम आई मिस्ड यू एंड व्हेन आई फाउंड आउट यू वर कमिंग टू कॉलेज आई वाज सो 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 हैप्पी एंड माय क्वेश्चन टू यू इज इन महाभारत uh we see amba she is so determined to take revenge on bhishma and she goes to shiva and shiva actually grants her that boon so why would somebody want to live their whole life just with the sole intention of taking revenge on somebody and how would this affect them thank you well whether we like it or not there are such people in the world all right yes or no are they there or not yes. they are there So Mahabharat is depicting all sorts of people. Every kind of character that can exist on the planet is there. There are over hundred thousand characters, representing the best, the worst, in between every range, is there. So she is one, because see, just now, some time ago, uh, when she asked the question, uh, something horrible happened to somebody, an abuse happened to somebody. and that person not willing to forget some will become hurt and wounded some will become angry and vengeful depending on their own nature and also the situation in which we exist so she is uh, in a royal setup here uh, vengeance is considered honor vengeance is not considered vengeance vengeance is considered as a virtue when somebody hurts a king or a queen they must go on finish them till you finish them your job is not done this is the culture that in which she is we must not look at it from today's time and today's culture that you are in that time she is in a royal family she is a princess and she is insulted she feels horribly insulted by what happened you know what happened to her life now she wants to at any cost extract a prize for that so she goes for that so she is asking shiva the question is why shiva is assisting her is that it is it the question yes uh shiva is like that only <laughs> because uh, you know this happened to him once ravana you heard of ravana ravana came to shiva and worshiped him and praised him and glory so he loved him so much and he said you ask whatever you want i'll give you and that guy says i want your wife shiva is in a mood like that he says okay take her parvati is having a bath in the manas rover close by and this guy goes looking for parvati to take her home then somebody goes and tells her shiva has granted permission that this man who's come from somewhere in the south he can take you and go with him you are like yes he lost his mind <laughs> then you know you have heard of these things have you been kissing frogs no you don't believe that story no this started long time ago <laughs> so parvati took a frog and made this frog into a beautiful young woman and left her in a lake adjacent to Manasarovar, which is today called as Rakshasthal. So Ravana went straight to Rakshasthal and saw this young woman. He thought she is Parvati, took her and went home. Then he realized she has come out of a frog, but she was Mandodari. That's why she is called Mandodari, one who came out of a frog. But she was beautiful and wonderful woman, so she became his queen and stayed there. but his his thing about wanting to take somebody's wife again took him to ayodhya you know <laughs> you know all the trouble that's another matter but you must understand this that which you are referring to as the highest or the divine cannot be discriminatory isn't it hello if god says whoever the god is if he says I am responsible for these people. I am not responsible for those people. Is he fired or no? Hello, fired or no? Because essentially, 
It is a response, a limitless response. When something responds to everybody, if their thing is right, then we say this is divine. It only responds to me, not to you. This is not divine, this is my party, isn't it? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> so when Ramana, as a great devotee, he worshipped him, he said, ask whatever you want, but that guy should have civilization. But he has nothing like that. He says, I want your wife. He says, okay, take her and go. So in that context, she burns in front of Shiva and says she's doing austerities after austerities, putting herself to extreme difficulties and says, all I want is to kill this man, give me the power. He said, okay, have it. But this does not mean it'll lead to your well-being. See what happened to Ravana. The same, uh, a man was driving in Mexico and he ran out of gas. Then he walked and there he saw a local monastery where monks were living with very meager resources. He said, my car is run out of gas, do something. So the monk said, see we don't have anything else here, we don't have cars, we don't have gas, but I can give you a mule, mule. You ride on the mule to the next town and then you can get gas there and come back. Only thing is we have trained the mules like this, you sit on it, you don't beat it, you don't do all that, you just say, play, praise the Lord, it will go. When you want it to stop, you say, Amen, it will stop. So he sat on it and said, praise the Lord. It went and went and went, did the whole day it traveled. Then he saw the mule was going straight towards a cliff edge. He wants to stop it, he's doing this, that, but he's forgotten the mantra. He tried everything but the mule is just going straight to the edge of the cliff. It came right here about to take its next step. Then he remembered and said, oh man, it stopped. He looked down two thousand feet below. Oh my God, praise the Lord <laughs> This happens, you know <laughs> Anybody, please take the microphone. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Pritika. I'm a grade 12 student. Um, so we're studying and living in this very overly competitive world where everybody wants to be the best. Um, and sometimes I find a difficulty in deciding what the right path is for me. Because even though I may be good at, say, dancing or singing, there's always somebody who's better than me. Um, so my question to you is, how do we find the motivation, <coughs> sorry, how do we find the motivation to do something that we like for the sole purpose of being happy ourselves instead of um, following, into, following the society's demands um, to, you know, be the best at what we do? Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, this ailment has caught us quite a bit. We don't want to be the best, really, if you really look at it, because you don't know what is the best. Does somebody know what is the best? Hello? Do we ever know what is the best? We don't know. All we want is, we want to be better than the person who is sitting next to us. This is a disease, because what you are enjoying in your life is not what you have. You enjoy what she doesn't have. She's number two, that's the only joy you have. When you enjoy something that other people do not have, or when you enjoy other people's suffering, when other people's suffering is the source of joy for you, I think it's sickness, not joy. Hello? Yes or no? It amounts to sickness or no? But right now this sickness has caught all of us, right from an early age they're teaching you this, at home they told you, you must be first rank. You never asked, what about the other children? I asked my mother this, she thought I've gone crazy. I asked, what about the other kids, if I come first? She said, this boy is crazy, because she's repeating what was told to her by somebody else. <laughs> 
So if I come first, what about the other children? It doesn't matter. You must sit on top of everybody's heads, only then life will happen. No. If your joy comes from the source of other people's suffering, you, it will not lead to well-being, either your well-being or the world's well-being, isn't it? So why do you want to be the best? What is important is, this life should find full expression. Hmm? Everything that this one has should come out of this in this life. This should not go unfulfilled. Whether it's better than that one or not is not even the issue. And every human being, have you seen one more person just like you? How fortunate, see? There isn't another human being like you because one more person like you on the planet would be trouble, huh? Too much. One is too much, isn't it? Two like you, ten like you would be impossible. So, nobody is like you. The important thing is, will you unfold all the possibilities that you hold within yourself? This is all the concern should be. But right now our systems are created like this all the time, who is fast, who is best, all this rubbish. Well, competition is okay for short term. You want to run a race, okay, who is going to win? That's fine. But life is not a race. If life becomes a race and if you want to win, you must hit the finish line first, isn't it? What does it mean? <laughs> you want to hit, hit the finish line today? No. So you better not win, you'd better not be the best. So don't make life into your race. Limited sport we will play here and there, where we race with each other. Just to test our grit, all right? Huh? You and me are going to race right now. Now we will race like our love de life depends on it for a short period of time. But if you make your entire life into your race and if you win, you're gone. No, no, not a good way to do life. So you don't have to be the best. You just have to be the best that you can be. Everything that you can be must happen. You don't have to be better than somebody else ever, it's not necessary. And nobody can be because every one of you is a unique being. When you're unique, is that better or you're one up on somebody, is that better? You are unique. <laughs> Namaskar. Before I begin, may I request you to ask two questions? Yes, sir. Before that, I love you so much. Ah. <laughs> oh, you j Oh, he just broke my heart. <laughs> Sadhguru, my uh, first question is, um, I'm not able to pull out uh, myself from the grief, like you know, whenever I see a child begging on the street, girl or a boy, I just, my conscience just keeps biting me like, you know, you are not doing this for them, you are not doing that for them. So, um, then I talk to myself saying that if I could earn unlimited, I could do so many things for them. So, I want to, I don't know how to get out of this uh, feel, this feeling. Whenever I see, I just, you know, my legs start walking towards them and uh, I, I just uh, spoil the mood for myself. So, how to, how to, how to be practical, like how, it's too much of emotion which is disturbing me. You see, uh, there is an unfortunate reality in the world, particularly in our country, where uh, many people have not eaten properly, a lot of children still go to bed without food in their stomach. This is a reality. But today, there is some encouraging news because United Nations has made a study and shows in the last decade, that is from 2006 to 2016, they made a study and they said about 270 million people in the country have come out of the poverty line in the last ten hours ten years rather, in the last decade. It's a fantastic news, isn't it? You're not saying anything, huh? In this country where over 
1.4 million children were dying of malnutrition before they become five years of age has come down by nearly uh, 430,000. Still 970,000 are dying, but we must celebrate the success, very important. Because everything needs a momentum, success needs a momentum. If you grieve over things which are bad, you will give momentum to those things which are bad. You must give momentum to those things which are solution. Don't give momentum to the problems, give momentum to the solutions that are happening. And the choice that you and me have is just this, do we want to be a part of the problem or do you want to be a part of the solution? This is all the choice we have. Now, let us say ten people are miserable here. More than ten faces are looking miserable. <laughs> Let us say ten people are miserable here and uh, because I see these ten faces, I will also become miserable. miserable. Have I solved something or have I added to the problem? Added to the problem, now there are eleven miserable people. So it's very, very important that if we want solutions, we must go beyond our natural, you know, reactive emotions that we have towards various things and look beyond that and see what is the solution. For that solution we must strive continuously. Will the solutions happen immediately? No. Maybe it will not happen in our lifetime. But are we a part of the solution? Always are we a part of the solution? Will all of you young girls take this stand in your life? You will always be a part of the solution. Hello? Always. No matter in what situation you are, whatever the situation of your life, it could be personal, it could be social, it could be national, you are always a part of the solution. You will not take sides with problems. Hello? This one thing you take in your life, you will see, you will know the joy of unfolding all your capacity. When you're part of the problem, your possibilities will not come out. When you're part of the solution, you will do things that you never imagined you could do in your life, simply because you will unfold into that possibility. So just become part of the solution. This does not mean you are the solution, no. Because there are people busy always creating new problems, if you solve one problem, they create a new problem. This happened. Can I tell you a joke? You all right? You're not too serious for that? No. A woman in Tennessee, you know our center in the United States is in Tennessee. So uh, a woman in Tennessee was marrying for the fifth time. So she was uh, just a day away from marriage, she was having dinner with her fiancé. And she served him mushroom soup and he took in a spoon and uh, nice candlelight and romantic and everything. Then uh, he asked, how did your first husband die? Uh, she said, well, he ate poison mushrooms and died. Okay. How did your second husband die? Oh, he also ate poison mushrooms and died. Now he kept the spoon there. <laughs> but how did the third one die? Oh, in fact, he also ate poison mushrooms and died. Now he got terrified. He asked, how did your fourth husband die? Well, he died of a broken neck because he refused to eat poison mushrooms. <laughs> So what do you want to have? <laughs> Let's be part of the solution. We are not the solution on this planet. We are part of the solution. We are adding to the solution, we are giving energy and strength to the solution, that's all. Will we solve everything? No. But we must have the fulfillment in our life that we have been a part of the solution, not part of the problem. How did you fall in love with me? Social media love, is it? Good afternoon, Sadhguru.
Sadhguru. My name is Sonia Alphonse. My question to you is, I personally feel that I function more efficiently in the night than I do in the day. It's not oh, that I've changed oh. my biological clock or something and I sleep during the day, but it's just that I feel more productive, not only while studying, but otherwise. I feel invigorated in the night. So why is it so? Maybe Thank you. Maybe you're in the wrong country, huh? <laughs> <laughs> There are three types of people who do not sleep in the night. A rogi will not sleep in the night. A rogi means a sick person because he cannot sleep. A bogi will not sleep in the night. A pleasure seeker will not sleep in the night because night is conducive for him, for his kind of business. A yogi also will not sleep in the night because for him also night is very conducive. Which one are you, you can decide, I don't want to say anything about it <laughs> Why night is? See, light, we value light because our visual apparatus are made in a certain way. See, that man has an eye in his hand also. Yes, because we value our visual apparatus so much, we thought two is not enough, three should come. Normally here, but if somebody got it here, what to do? Wrong place, but at least you can close it and open it. But we value our visual apparatus so much, simply because they designed in such a way that only in light you can see. What light does to you is, it makes everything distinct. See, now because it is lit, I can see this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. Suppose lights went off and it this became dark, I just see a mass of people. I don't see this person, this person, this person. So there is a certain sense of lack of boundaries in the night. So for yoga, for sexuality, for friendship, for being together, for study, for focus, for all these things, Night seems to be more conducive because the difference between what is you and what is the other comes down in the light… in the night simply because our visual apparatus function like this. Where there is no light, everything merges in our experience. So a yogi, a bogi and a rogi, all three of them make use of the night. You can also make use of it, there's no problem unless you're sleeping in the classroom. If you're not sleeping in the classroom, it's fine, nothing wrong with it. But you will see, you try this and see, mornings are a nuisance. But, can I share something? I was made like this. I… if I sleep in the morning, normally my school used to be 8.30 in the morning, from 6.45, my mother and my sisters will start waking me up. It's a series of uh, efforts. <laughs> Many things, they'll make me sit up in the bed, <laughs> they'll come and twist my arm and do this and this. My mother will do it gently, my sisters will <laughs> do that. Then they will drag me and my mother will put toothpaste on the toothbrush and give it to me, I'll stick it in my mouth and <laughs> She'll get me my clothes and say, go and sh have shower, it's time up, time up. I go inside the bathroom and fall asleep. <laughs> if nobody wakes me up, till one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, I'll just sleep like a rock, not wake up and roll around, simply dead. But I started practicing yoga at the age of twelve, in about maybe eight to nine months. After that, no matter where I am, even till this day, where I am, which time zone I am, every day I am in a different time zone, but at 3.35, 3.40, I just come awake because some changes happen in the nature at that time. I… my body just comes awake. If I want, I can get up and do what I want. If I don't want, I can sleep some more but it always comes awake. 
So you have to bring some sensitivity into the system that, see you are a product of this planet, yes or no? Whatever nonsense individuals may think about themselves, we are all just a pop-up from this planet. You seen those pop-ups on the computer screen? Pop, pop, yes? <laughs> You're just a pop-up, you'll be gone. You can't believe you will be gone, huh, me? I will be gone? Yes, all the very smart people, countless number of people who walked this planet before and you and me, where the hell are they, huh? Not a sign, all became topsoil, isn't it so? Weren't they pop-ups? Aren't you a pop-up? Poop, poop. You may think you have a great life and this and that, as far as the earth is concerned, it's just recycling its soil. Just throws you up and draws you back, throws you up and draws you back. So in this little pop-up, the important thing and the most important thing is, you create sensitivity within you, such sensitivity, that every dimension of life comes into your experience. Before you fall dead, is it not important? You experience this life in this fullest possible scale, yes or no? Experience means people think, we must party every day. No, no, same damn thing how many times you will do. There is much more for the human life to explore. You must become sensitive. When I say sensitive, because the word sensitive is used in a wrong way in the sense, when people say, oh, she is very sensitive, we are supposed to understand uh, she will get hurt for just about anything. Yes? No, being sensitive to life and being ego-sensitive are two different things. Being sensitive to life means if you walk into this hall, you experience everything that's here, you don't miss a thing. If you walk outside, you don't miss a thing, every dimension of life should come into your experience. This happened. Shankar and Pillai bought a work… Uh, what? He bought a work donkey and the man who was selling the donkey said, see this is a very sensitive donkey. You cannot beat this donkey. You cannot use bad words, you cannot abuse this donkey. Shankar and Pillai said, that's great, every day I'm tired of beating these donkeys and abusing every day, I have to use filthy words to get these donkeys moving. I like a sensitive donkey and he played li paid little extra bonus for the sensitivity of the donkey and took it home. He left it in his… in the barn and tomorrow morning he has to go to work. He went there and told the donkey, please let's go. No response. He said, please, let us go. Nothing. He went down on his knees and prayed, nothing. You're not supposed to abuse it, you're not supposed to beat it. Not knowing what to do, he went back to the man who sold the donkey. See, I… Pr I… I requested, I pleaded, I prayed, he's not responding, what am I supposed to do? That man said, is that so, let me see, and he came. He picked up a thick stick like this, one whack on the head, and then he threw the stick and said, come. The donkey followed. Shankar and Bilai got furious, you idiot, you said it's a sensitive donkey and the way you hit this animal, I've never hit an animal like this in my life. He said, no, 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 he's very sensitive, first you have to get his attention. <laughs> so developing sensitivity means if you simply close your eyes, uh, you must know what face of moon it is right now because all this is playing in your body. Every day it is playing in your system. Do you see if it's a full moon or a new moon, the entire ocean is coming up? There are tides, isn't it? You ever been to the ocean side or you don't? You do? There are tides? Yes. The whole ocean is trying to rise. Seventy-two percent of your body is water. You think nothing is rising? It is. For every position of the sun, moon and many things that are happening to the planet, they're happening to you. You must become life sensitive, then you will know how to manage every aspect of your life. Don't become ego sensitive, don't become society sensitive, life sensitive if you become. What's happening this, this, with this life if you know this one thing all the time? You will see, you got your GPS on, 
there's really no problem, you will never get lost. It doesn't matter who says what, what kind of situations you're put into, you are never ever lost because you're life sensitive. This is all this life needs, that this has to become life sensitive. Right now we have developed a psychological structure which has got nothing to do with life, it's got something to do with the social scene, got nothing to do with the life. Thank you very much. I think people… Are we okay? Because people are looking at watches, so I thought I've exceeded my time. Um, that was the last question we were taking. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can put it up on social media. Uh, Sadhguru, we would like to thank you so much no, no, for no. gracing us with your <laughs> presence today. We would like to thank… Well, I would like to say a few words. All of you young girls or women or however we refer to you, you look like girls to me. That may be because of my… See, I want you to understand, everywhere in the world but particularly in our country, so many young women of your age, in rural India, in various other levels of society, what all they are going through in terms of lack of nourishment, lack of education, abuse, all kinds of terrible things, no opportunity of any kind. All of you have come into a premier institution like this, make this a possibility, don't get tangled up with your own thoughts, emotions and make a misery out of this life. You must become a great possibility for yourself and every other life around you. Hmm? Beyond, beyond gender, beyond race and religion, even beyond nationality, just function as a human being. This education should become an empowerment to empower you to become a great human being because without producing great human beings, we are not going to produce a great nation. May the best be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.